we have run about 30 minutes uh, for a discussion, uh, but we don't want to do it just the three in front. Uh, but I would like to invite all of you to, to ask questions and then give comments. But uh, first of all, I would like to um, invite uh, Jessica to uh, briefly react on uh, Yoni's yeah, sure. uh, talk. Yeah, just open some water. Um, yeah, I can, I can. First of all, I think your talk was fantastic oh, because this is something just that um, was really um, you know, has been on my mind a lot, you know, obviously having been a teacher before and um, also having taught big data in Kufstein. So um, primarily on the topic of ethics. And um, I, think, I think what's really interesting is that uh, with your talk is that the importance to shed light on these issues because um, we're at a point where we have this amazing technology um, but it's always important to see how that relates to the kinds of laws that are operating in different contexts. At the moment, obviously, there are a lot of um, American ed tech companies that are operating in the European space, and there are different laws and regulations in place. Mm -hmm. um, with McGraw-Hill, then, there is a data governance council that was set up mm -hmm. in order to address these kinds of issues uh, because it's so complex. And I was actually just introduced to this recently. And I think that your point that you were saying, which was uh, we should be aware of these issues so that we do not hinder innovation. However, it's important to not go forward blindly. Yeah. yeah. And that I completely agree with this because um, in terms of informing the, not only the teachers, but also the students themselves, what, um, where that data is going, how it's used, um, and, and also if it's shared. You know, in terms of McGraw-Hill, it's not shared with a third party, and uh, the main aim is to improve the learning outcomes of the students and the teachers. Um, but I'm absolutely with you that there should be this um, cautious nature around what's being developed in terms of innovation, and it shouldn't just be, yes, innovation is the way forward blind, you know, yeah. so yeah. that's my reaction on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I have, in a way, the same question to, to both of you. You both were talking about um, the possibility of, of teachers to have more freedom, to have more possibilities to, to create learning activities and learning environments. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, I had the feeling that both data protection regulations, but also data-driven decisions uh, can uh, be, uh, uh, well, can, can attack this freedom of <coughs> teachers. For example, you uh, um, mentioned the flipped classroom, and, and then you told us how uh, the students can work with your system and that they get a tutor within the system. And the more you were talking, the more the, the teacher disappeared. Mm -hmm. So it, it looks like I have the, the, the learning, the, the, the mm -hmm. digital learning environment mm -hmm. at home, mm -hmm. and I can do everything at home, mm -hmm. and then I go to school and have a teacher for what reason anymore? Oh, yeah. So yeah. that's yeah, uh, sure. the, the, the one question. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, when, when you're talking and say, well, we, have, uh, we, we need data protection regulations, if you have more and more regulations, and you have to ask teachers and, and students all the time for, for uh, well, for, uh, to, to agree to something, does this uh, will, will lock teachers in at the same time? So mm -hmm. maybe you can start. Yeah, sure. Um, great question and very important. Uh, the role of teacher is fundamental to the learning process. And the importance that I showed of the, the learning, uh, digital learning product, I think that I wanted to really show the kind of opaque, um, perhaps make it a bit more transparent about the learning science behind the products. So that's why I was very focused so much on the product. Um, but in terms of how it's used, that's something that actually is really being worked on at the moment in terms of consultancy, because the, the products, I mean, I'm sure some of you have probably had learning products at home when you were growing up at school, or perhaps you used it at university um, or beyond university with MOOCs and so on. And it's it's only one aspect of it, you know. Mm -hmm. It's and it's I think the way in which we are teaching and learning is going is go undergoing huge reform at the moment, and it's about 
how, what role does that technology play? You know, that's the kind of questions that you were raising. Mm -hmm. um, is it central to the learning experience, or is it just an add-on? If it's just an add-on, then is it really necessary? Yeah. And probably not. So how can we create those kinds of blending learning environments where we do use the tools that are out there in mm -hmm. terms of the innovation, but the central importance is always the teacher and the student. Mm -hmm. and how is that <coughs> technology informing the learning process so that the student and the teacher can then create better, more interactive learning environments? I mean, for example, when I was um, at, at some schools, then a lot of, you know, the teachers were saying, particularly with girls, um, they're struggling with math mathematics, not because of their way of uh, learning, but because of their confidence. Mm -hmm. And if, for example, that's one of uh, the things about the adaptive learning is that it helps you with the metacognition. So it says, okay, if you are not confident, please let us know. You let the system know. And then it brings you back more content of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so the girls in this particular circumstance were able to practice a bit more and mm -hmm. therefore gain confidence so that when they got into the classroom, then they were like, I know this. Okay. So it's mm -hmm. about how can we use that technology for the learning environment, not here's the technology, let's forget about the teacher. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a bit, Thank you. Yeah. And the other side of the, yeah. of the medal, how can, or, or is there a risk that, that regulations uh, yeah. can, can narrow the freedom of, of teachers? If, if we look at those uh, legislation efforts in, in, in America and the US to, to address the risk of the student data, we see that one of the solutions, solutions would just to provide more opportunities for notice and for consent mm -hmm. for, to parents. Mm -hmm. Now, as you were saying earlier before, this may, this may block a little bit the educational process because I would need the uh, consent of each parent to every step of the way. Okay, it can be, it can slow the process, of course, and it can be quite a burden for the teacher to uh, end out papers all the time to sign for. T uh, but mm -hmm. it can be done ad uh, in a different way. It can be. It doesn't have to be that particular to every new situation to uh, to get a consent. Mm -hmm. It can be that. First of all, as I was saying, it can be a personalized privacy policy. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, a parent can choose whatever he wants to do with the data, okay? Does he agree to share it and which kind of data? Mm -hmm. And it can also be at the, at the beginning of the year. It doesn't have to be all the time. So we need to find this kind of balance between uh, this need to get an informed, a really informed consent, yeah. okay? That really understand in a transparent way what are the possible uses of the data that we are sharing, but on the other end, we don't want to hinder and to damage the process mm -hmm. by, um, by telling the teacher to end out all the time papers and mm -hmm. agreements all the time, okay? Mm -hmm. it, will make, it will make education law, eventually. Yeah. No, I was just, I, what came to my mind was when, um, you know, during the courses that I ran with my charity, then we had this on a very kind of low-tech level of um, the media release forms. You know, and this was really important to hand over to the students, the media release forms. Do you want um, your children to be photographed um, yeah, yeah, yeah. or filmed? Because often mm -hmm. the film was used as a way of learning, yeah. right? And some of them didn't, which is totally fine. And then I was talking with the people who filmed, and I said, right, you have to be careful because they don't yeah. want to be filmed. And it didn't hinder any, any kind yeah. of learning process, which was... Yeah, but this is when when we were filled for one time, two times, three times yeah. a year, okay? Yeah. We are talking about an ongoing filming that is happening all the time. Because yeah. yeah. when you collect data, you're actually filming the students all the time. Yeah. So it's not like to, uh, to request consent for two times, three times a year. Yeah. This is the educational process itself. Yeah. Okay, it's like yeah. you are teaching through the camera. Yeah. yeah. So this is a different uh, kind. I would like to... to um ask this question in, in, in a slightly different way again. I, I totally agree when you say we need a consent between uh, educational institutions, uh, the providers of the systems and, and, and parents, but what happens if some parents disagree and, and if, if there is no consent, what mm -hmm. does that mean? Exactly. And, and what 
does it mean in in a uh, context of, of of social justice so if if i don't have a consent for example in a school does it mean i don't use these systems exactly and mm -hmm. then they are only used by students where parents can afford them to buy them privately yes of course uh, so, yeah of course it would be it would be ridiculous to have a classroom that only part of it can use these digital platforms and the other side cannot okay yeah. And this is one of the reasons why I suggested the personalized data use policy. Mm -hmm. So, and, 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 and I'm sure that they can do it. That at the company, they can do it. They can let you um, use the platform mm -hmm. under your, with some limitations, your conditions, okay? Okay. If it will lead eventually to, uh, to the result that only certain uh, uh, children or children, stud uh, students will be able to use and the other ones will not, this is a problem that should be addressed also. Mm. Okay. Now, I mean, I think, it's a, I think it's an interesting point. I mean, there are two different things there. Like, you know, you mentioned <coughs> about um, affording and consent. I think there are two separate issues there. Yep. Um, you know, whether a student or parents can afford the technology or whether the, um, the parents and the students consent to it. Yep. Um, you know, in terms of affordability, then I think that is a very strong issue that needs to be looked at in terms of where the money is coming from. Is it coming from the institutions, which is mm -hmm. the ideal? Yeah. Um, but only when it's been identified that this would uh, advance or enhance the kind of learning spaces that the teachers and the students are looking for. So therefore, it needs a lot of market research, which mm -hmm. is slowing down the process. But I think that's good because, yeah. you know, Know, it's better to slow down the process to go straight forward without thinking. So doing a lot of research about the needs of the students, the needs of the teachers, and if it fits. If it doesn't fit, then it's not, yeah. it's not appropriate. And you know, then, of course, you can uh, um, decide whether it's um, important to invest in that technology or not. And in terms of like, whether the students then, some of the students or some of the teachers decide or not decide, that's a really good issue because if not, then how can we create a diverse learning space? Mm -hmm. And what kind of dynamic would that bring about? Mm -hmm. It might bring about an interesting dynamic. It might not. And these are questions I think we need to be aware of when we go into using ed tech in the learning spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I would like to invite you to ask your questions, if there are any. <coughs> I, I would have some more, but. Are we, uh, just a second, I think we have a microphone for you. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, Max Grafenstein, I'm a researcher at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute. Um, so I just would like to know if you take the example of the in Bloom disaster. Um, so how do you avoid that now? So if you try to sell your products, in particular in Germany, and you know that Germans or in Germany there's um, uh, uh, yes, there, there's this German angst, yeah, in, in particular uh, for uh, data protection mm -hmm. risks. So, do you have a strategy to tackle this? You mean uh, to tackle the angst, or yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I mean, if you if you want to sell your products here mm -hmm. on the market. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it's a good question. I think that. What's important in Germany, it operates very different from the rest of Europe. I have colleagues who are in Amsterdam, who are in the um, Scandies, and we always discuss, you know, uh, how different it is here. And um, I actually enjoy working here because of that reason, because the cautious nature in which you approach education, I think, is really um, a model for the rest of Europe because it's important to see, okay, you go into an institution, whether it be a higher education institution or a school, and you talk with the teachers, and of course that angst comes up, and you develop this communication with them about the, that technology. What does that technology involve? What kind of data is it? And then I'm feeding that back to the product team. And mm -hmm. I, just yesterday I was in Madrid, and I was talking to the product team in Spain about these issues. And he says, these are really good issues that you're bringing up. Maybe we should feed it back to the American team. So I think it's a dialogue, you know? Mm -hmm. And that dialogue cannot, I mean, these kinds of um, ed tech uh, products cannot be developed in isolation. They are for the students, they are for the teachers. If they are in, developed in dialogue, mm -hmm. then we can move forward in the right way. And I think Germany is quite a leader in terms of 
let's say, bringing to light these issues. You know, they're not afraid to. So I think it's a good thing. Okay. So that's an interesting point of view. I wouldn't have it beforehand. Okay. Other questions? I have a question to Jessica. Oh, you used to? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Uh, those issues that you're talking about, about Germany being concerned about, yeah. are those, as I was talking about, like, in, in human rights or in pedagogical concerns? Of, are these pr products really useful or do we really, really need those products? I think it's both. It's both. Yeah, so um, a lot of, as you said, like a lot of the um, lecturers, they say, do we, ne do we need this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, what's actually as a result of the feedback that we've got from the lecturers and the students, we're actually developing a new product that's more custom um, made for the students and the teachers. So, which means that we don't build the product and then go into these institutions and deliver it. Mm -hmm. It's about what do you need? What are the privacy issues? What are the data issues? Now let's try and have this dialogue and build the product with you. And that gives more control the, to the institution. Yeah. And yeah. Is it school based or is it? Um, this is, it's a very new product that's actually being developed in schools, in higher ed, and also in companies. So, so I think, um, you know, to answer your question, then it's about pedagogy, but also then the, the rights issue. And yeah. 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 That, that raised for me uh, a question, <coughs> um, how uh, are teachers able to, to customize? This product. Mm -hmm. So you, you say you, you develop it uh, in, in dialogue with teachers, yeah. but is it at one stage it's, it's finished and then it, it's given to, the, or do I have as a teacher as a possibility to to customize it? Yes. And how much do I have access to to the the data in the background? Mm -hmm. And this raises a question of of discrimination of of students maybe or so. This, this two questions, because in, in your talk you say, well, there's always a risk of human errors. Yes. And, and, <laughs> and, and if, if I give uh, a lot of data, and even your small data, in the hand of one teacher can be big data in a, in a way, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you deal with this possi possible uh, error? Yeah. Uh, so there are two kind of separate yeah. questions there. I'll just answer the latter. Um, in terms of discrimination of students, this is a really good point and something that I got quite interested in when I looked at uh, big data and the predictive analytics, mm -hmm. you know, which you also brought up. I think that uh, you, one must be all, all almost very cautious about the way in which it's predicting. So, for example, if a student is, uh, you mentioned, at risk, yeah? Mm -hmm. that in itself should be taken as it is. Mm -hmm. The data is predicting that. It is not looking at the social environment factors. It's not looking at how the student is with the teacher or the school environment. And it, it is information, mm -hmm. and it can inform certain factors, but it's not an absolute. <coughs> and that's something that I think, I'm not sure of how that can be communicated a bit more, but I think that in terms of when ed tech companies are working with the students, with the teachers, then that needs to be at the outset laid out that this is only information mm -hmm. and that you yourselves need to create that dialogue with the students to understand why is that happening. And maybe they might have more information themselves. So yeah. it's an information tool. Yeah, okay. Um, in terms of, um, you mentioned how much do, how much control do they have. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, the, again, this is a very new uh, way of working, and it's come about from the kinds of environments like in Germany, and it's based on the idea of instructional design, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite popular in the states. It's also yeah. you know research is being done here, for example, at the LMU, and that instructional design is at the forefront of the development of the product. And mm -hmm. that instructional design is done with the institution, whether it be the school, with the uh, students, and with the teachers. And I'm very excited about this because it's more dialogical. Mm -hmm. And then the data is um, communicated a bit more mm -hmm. with the, the teachers and the yeah. students. Yeah. Well, just to, to hand this question also to you, the, the question of, of some human error. Can, can, you, can you deal with, with is it at least um, possible to deal with, with regulations 
with this human uh, aspect of, of making errors and mistakes? Uh, uh, first of all, it's, it's a bit funny that humans make errors, but alg algorithms do, do not make errors. <laughs> okay. Because, so, um, no, I think that the human error in, I mean, in, in prediction, for example, okay, mm -hmm. for to predict, yeah. yeah. So, I'm not sure that if if a, a teacher receives a visualization or a report <coughs> about a student, I'm not. Does he have any discretion at all to decide? Oh, absolutely. And, and he does. Yeah. He, yes, yeah. but does he really have discretion? Because if you target an exam and, and identify a student as at risk, mm -hmm. okay. So I would say, okay, this is what the computer says. Mm. Okay, he decided this student is at risk, so it, it might as well be at risk. Or is, is, is at risk, and this can make um, teachers. It can make them not to not activate their discretion just because of the the report, just because the algorithm said something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm saying, okay, this is something that the algorithm says. It has nothing. It has nothing to do with it anymore. Okay. So this also shifts the educator's role. Okay, yeah. what am I? I'm only uh, the speaker of the algorithm. I'm mm -hmm. also only the speaker of the uh, for for the report. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a huge danger, and I think that's something um, that is you know it's like the ethics of algorithm, yeah. right? And I I'm fully for developing when you're developing the instructional design with the teachers and the students bringing ethics into play, mm -hmm. you know, and <coughs> yeah. saying, okay, what, does, what do these kinds of analytics mean? What do they tell you? They only tell you part of the story. They don't okay. tell you the full story. And so if you take them as being full story, then it's bound to go in a different direction than if you take a holistic approach. And that's why I think it's so important for this dialogue between the product development and the students and the teachers, rather than it just being, okay, here's the technology, that will solve your problem. Yeah, but w when the product is already ready, okay, mm -hmm. and out on the market, yeah. um, other yeah. teachers will use it, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And then, is this software a recommendation or is it, is it a decision? Yeah. I wouldn't know, because I, I wasn't yeah. part of the process. Because yeah, yeah. I do receive, eventually, you cannot um, custom made a product to each, each teacher or each student, so it will yeah. be replicated. Yeah, yeah, you. Sorry, go. Yeah, I think that's a, it's, it's really an interesting uh, question how to enable teachers to to continue this dialogue mm -hmm. you you doing with with teachers by uh, while you are developing the the, uh, the tools to uh, to the classroom when, when teachers not in direct contact mm -hmm. with you and I think it, it's a question how to um, support teachers to use those products and it's not just a technical question so to teach them how to use technology but it's more um, uh, a question to teach them or to, to support them to to use the information and then to use them to to create a dialogue mm -hmm. so it's, it's uh, an issue of uh, well personal development of, of, of teachers as well so it's yeah. not just to, to bring it to schools and sell it but also to develop teachers to, to use it yeah, properly. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like social media, like, you know, the social media, the technology yeah. is there. And then, you know, I, I was teaching young girls um, about how to use social media, um, not, okay, you must do it like this and you must do it like that, but just to be aware that there are tools there and you can use them in a way that perhaps might damage um, mm -hmm. their peers, yep. themselves, yep. put themselves at risk, or they can be aware of the risks and be more informed to make their own decisions. And with the analytics, then you have the information that they can be used as a standalone and, oh, this person is at risk and therefore we're not going to let them into this school. Or it can be used to identify, okay, this person looks like they're struggling on a particular learning objective. What are the reasons for that? Is yeah. it because I made, like the teacher made, the, the learning objective too difficult because you can actually um, decide on the learning objectives mm -hmm. through the system. So do I need to like put the, the level lower or is it something to do with the way that the mm -hmm. student is learning? And let's have a dialogue about this. So I agree there is an absolute risk and it's about how that technology is used. I think technology itself is neutral. You know? yeah. 
in, in a way, we, we come back to, to your uh, question of, of, of consent. So it's not only a question to have a consent at the, uh, at the beginning to use data in, a, in a, this or that way, but it's also um, to, well, to, to continue the discussion, discussion about this consent, yeah, how to, to interpret uh, <coughs> data yeah. all the time and, and, and again and again and between students uh, and teachers and, and maybe parents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Over there, yeah. With, with the glasses and the... Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Isabella Hermann. I'm working for the uh, Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And I have a question um, um, going also in the direction of consent. Because let just imagine there was a company, like a third party, like um, what was the name, Inbloom? Um, and this company um, would be accepted, right? So there would be this problem, actually, that maybe using algorithms students are um, in danger of being um, kind of, so if they wa failed once, um, they have no um, possibility to develop anymore, right? This is what you, what you kind of said. <laughs> or that you're kind of in this, in this direction and then you have no possibility um, to improve yourself again because then you are in this, you are labeled kind of because you, you failed. So, but there might be another problem because actually if, if there um, was some consent needed and then some people say, okay, um, I, don't, I don't want this, I don't want my, my data to be collected. And you have two parts. So the, one part of the students um, uh, consent to the system and the other is not. So would you say there is also risk for their future life because actually you could sell this data to companies and then you're kind of suspicious, right? Because why? Why didn't this person consent? So what, what does this person have to hide? And <laughs> yeah. the others, yeah. and the others um, are kind of, yeah, you're, you, everyone can see what you achieved or what you succeeded in, and then you might be interesting for, for other companies. So would you say this is another, another risk that you're excluded or marginalized um, in, in the whole career working space progress? Thank you. We, we have another question. Maybe we just collect a little bit and then, then we have a last answer round. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Eike Gref and I have been a student myself not too long time ago. And I, well, I will try to have a rather brief question because that was a rather complex one. I would be very curious to know about the reasons when schools refuse to work with you. I imagine you are approaching institutions. Um, what are the reasons they are giving you for not wanting to work with you? And the second one is um, in your presentation you were kicking off with uh, small data as allegedly your method. And I would like to know if you were um, ready to settle for big enough data and uh, well, as, as <laughs> if you would be uh, ready to settle for big enough data as the basis for your tool, because otherwise I would be very surprised about the um, element in your presentation where you were talking about uh, data-driven decision-making. Mm -hmm. And I would like to hear just more on um, how you would um, talk about small data and this, of course, very uh, focused data you presented and um, which decisions later on are based on that data and if those decisions are only applied to adapting your tool, improving your tool, or also which kind of tasks or encouragements are fed back mm -hmm. to the students. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the two mm -hmm. questions, okay. thank you. Maybe we start with a short one with you and then we go over to the second. Okay, um, so in terms of your first question uh, to do with schools, what are the <coughs> reasons for refusing uh, to work with us? Um, in my experience, then the reason... Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in, in my experience, then the reasons have been regarding content. So at the moment, then, the content 
yeah, unfortunately, it's not really to do with data, but that's just my experience. Um, it's more about uh, the, the lack of adaptive content for schools, because most of the adaptive content is being developed for higher education. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also because a lot of the rights of the content um, are being held uh, in the US. And so uh, there is an issue about we need to develop more content for K-12. Yep. Um, that's, that's been the major refusal in my experience. I'm sure that my colleagues has probably experienced something else. Um, yeah, I yeah. can only speak from experience, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the small data, and um, I think I understood the question. Is it something about um, which decisions are then bringing back what kind of content in that small data? Is that right? Or is it something more? That was part of my question. Yeah. Yep. Just wondering if so you yeah, could just I, clarify. I admit that I, I could have done better at being clear with this question. Yeah. Um, so if you want to stick to um, the point that you are using small data mm -hmm. as the basis for uh, developing your tool, yeah. um, I, I, I would like to know um, if the element of data-driven decision-making that you had on your slides Mm -hmm. refers to using this small data that is collected from the students mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to improve the tool in the future mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. also um, to come to decisions about uh, the students' parkour. Uh, yeah. For example, uh, are they evaluated as being rather weak or rather strong mm -hmm. on the basis of that small data, which I imagine are then mm -hmm. their level of confidence they indicate or their uh, um, relation of correct answers as uh, compared to incorrect answers because that, in my opinion, still is creating a profile. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then we have, in my understanding, mm -hmm. an activity of profiling, mm -hmm. which is very much linked to big data and big data analytics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and which of course has the risk of German angst, coming back <laughs> to you. And so I might as well ask, does relabeling your tool as small data work for you in Germany mm -hmm. as a way to make people less afraid of you. Oh, I see. Okay, now I get it. All right, thank you okay. for clarifying. So that was the background to my question, right, but right, I'm still right. curious yeah. about the core of the question. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Is it only used to improve your tool, or mm -hmm. does it affect the students and the evaluation? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Now I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, in terms of the small data, then it, the way in which the decisions are made, then, and the kind of content it brings back. Of course, it brings back the content that is uh, in the, so for example, we're a publishing, we originally were a publishing company, changed to a learning science company, which means that the content that is being fed back is based, for example, with SmartBook, then the content is based on the particular book, you know, the content of the book. And so, for example, if a student is struggling with um, a particular learning objective, then the content that is fed back is what is in the digital book, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not about, okay, the student is weak because they um, do not answer the question correctly or that their um, metacognition, their confidence level is, is low. It's not saying, okay, this student is weak. It's saying, how can we improve or how can we give the student more opportunity to understand the concept or the learning objective that is in that material? Mm -hmm. And the way that is done is that, um, I mean, I showed you a little bit like the knowledge space. Mm -hmm. So you enter from different aspects. Yeah. And so, you know, one student may find that the learning objective, this learning objective is better to, learn, uh, to enter from this type of material. Mm -hmm. And the algorithm feeds back the content that suits that particular knowledge of um, the, the diagnostic knowledge of that student. But it's never saying, you are weak. You know, it's okay. not profiling that student as you know, at, at risk, so to speak. I know that's yeah. being used in the US quite a lot, yeah. mm -hmm. but that's not really the, the aim of the program. It's more to actually give the student the better chance to learn differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, learning mathematics at school, I did it completely different from everybody else. Yeah. And without the adaptive learning program, then I was seen as a weak student, but in fact, I was just different. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. sorry. Okay. Thank I you. hope that answers uh, your question. It didn't really relate to the angst, but... 
Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and then finally I would give, give the question mm. uh, from over there to, to you. The, the, if I remember right, it was a question uh, of, of labeling, but more the, the question if people don't agree, <laughs> don't have a consent, and, and mm. then they don't use a system uh, that may be a risk for the future. And uh, how can, can regulations deal with that? Uh, this problem that you were talking about, it, it, it's generic. It, 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 uh, the same in most fields in the digital age. Mm -hmm. For example, you don't want your employer or a potential employer to have uh, access to your Facebook account. But on the other hand, if you do not have a Facebook account, you will think, what's wrong with this guy? He doesn't, he doesn't have a Facebook, okay? So, um, but consent is only one, one bolt, or one, one principle in the, whole, in the overall data protection regime. It's not only about consent. As I was saying earlier, it doesn't have to be on or off. Another principle can be access to data. So you can consent to the collection and to share your information and to, to uh, uh, share your personal data, but you should also uh, be provided with or receive the right to access this data and to know exactly, it's the student or his parents, what has been collected so far. And you should have the ability to change this data. So, for example, if in the fifth grade you used to absent a lot, okay, or you had, I don't know, certain problems because your parents got divorced or whatever, and eventually you don't get accepted to, uh, to Harvard, okay, just because in the fifth grade, you should be able to know that this is one of the reasons, okay? And now, the solution is not consent. The, the solution in this regard should be uh, access to data and ability to change data and ability to update data and ability to know what's been collected. And you know, know what, not even what's been collected, but what kind of profile has been built. Con you can have access to all this kind of data, but without, having, without understanding what's been built. So this is... <coughs> But, uh, I think that was a, a good answer uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, it, it raises a lot of questions, uh, but, but we don't have the time to, to ask all these questions. Uh, but one last question, okay. Hello, my name is Shahid. Uh, I, I'm a business intelligence analyst, and I, I'm an algorithm developer. Uh, I have worked in different segments of education, telecom, and e-commerce. My question is for both of you, uh, one question. How uh, are you managing the content creation cycle? That's a big uh, question because at the end of the day, it's all about content distribution and how efficient and uh, personalized it is to help uh, in the learning curve of any student at any level. And it kind of uh, includes a, another dynamic uh, complexity that is the level of learning. For example, some student in grade eight has a different level of consuming the information and somebody at grade five has a different conceptual understanding. So how are you managing that? And uh, what is your feedback loop for the interaction of the student with the platform. So once a student interacts with the platform, how it's being feedback in the whole system that the other students can get benefit out of his interaction. And uh, my question for you regarding da data privacy is that if uh, your concept of uh, personalized data privacy is very nice, but if all the com if the company commits that all the information that we are going to collect from the users would only be used for educational content recommendation and kind of personalized learning and all of that, and it won't be used for any commercial ads or things like that, does it satisfy the overall data privacy paradigm issue that we are facing either in US or in Europe? So. So maybe we have one last brief answer. Very brief. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. Okay. <coughs> Shall I? Yeah. 
Shall I start? Yeah, okay, yes, so um, in terms of how is the data being fed back into the system, this is a very good question. And I think it's about going back to um, this kind of variety and the velocity and the volume. Uh, it's obviously the volume has been co collected uh, for many years and on different learning objectives by thousands and thousands of students. And then it informs the system how that content is being understood. Mm -hmm. There is always, um, if you go to the, um, the Learn Smart book, then there is always a point in where you can actually challenge the answers. Mm -hmm. So, and that's something that's also really important because the students may themselves have another perspective on the content. And then this feeds back into the product and the author, because it's a publishing company, then the, the, um, the answers that being, are being fed back are then um, the understanding, not the actual specific data itself, but the understanding of how those students are interacting with the content is, you know, it, it creates a basis for the authors to then develop their content further, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, how the content creation cycle is working, how mm -hmm. we're managing that. Um, yeah, difficult, difficult question. Maybe, yeah, just a quick clarification on that. Do you mean, um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe just be because we're running a little bit out of time, uh, we, we can transfer this uh, question to the third part of the evening uh, and, and give you the possibility to answer. So I'll divide my uh, answer into two parts. I'll do it short, mm -hmm. but I'll divide it into two parts. Um, First of all, with all those stories about data leakage and about breach of, uh, of uh, security, data security, I'm not sure if you can trust. You know, if, even if they obligate that data will not be shared, I'll take this one, okay. But leave this aside. Um, I think that the main point about my presentation and my talk earlier was that it's not all about uh, flow of information. It's not all about whether a net a company shares the information or whether it uh, sells us advertisements. You know. It's also about other rights or other um, objectives that should be fulfilled, such as intellectual privacy. I think the concept of intellectual privacy, uh, and I do rec recommend everyone to read Neil Richard's book about intellectual privacy, um, this is not about sharing data or about transferring data. This is about limiting or maybe adjusting how data is being collected. So, uh, no, I will, not, I will not be satisfied by an obligation or um, a commitment not to share data. This is only a start, okay? In the US, this is what has been happening for the last three years or so. Um, there was the, the pledge, the student privacy pledge, and many diverse uh, state level and federal level uh, legislation, most of them did address the issue of flow of information, okay? Mm -hmm. About limiting the uh, vendor's ability to share it with force parties, okay, with the other parties. But it's not all about this. And th this is why the mounting uh, debate about student privacy or student data use is still going on. Even though there are many, uh, M many wide range uh, legislate, legislation that already been enacted. California, for example, you have, you have several uh, laws that are pending. So it's not all about this, so it, I won't be satisfied. Okay. Thank you very much. And we are now moving to the third part of the evening because there are many questions to discuss and to ask. And Maybe you, you will talk to each uh, other. I would like to thank you, uh, Jessica White, and um, Joni Hakaman for your interesting talks and for the discussion. And I would like to thank you uh, for your questions and for your time. And finally, I would like to thank the Alexander von Humboldt Institute, uh, Institute für Gesellschaft und Internet and the Vodafone Institute for Society and Communication for making it possible tonight and to give us the chance to move to the third uh, part of the <laughs> of the event and to discuss all these questions with a few drinks, I guess, over there. So just join us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>